This week, the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, we are honored to sit down with Timothy Bogart, son of the legendary Neil Bogart. Timothy talks to us about his upcoming movie, Spinning Gold, which comes out March 31st. Spinning Gold is a movie about the life of Neil Bogart, all of his labels, all of his artists. What a journey into musical history this is. Welcome to the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, founded in 2011 and with over 500 weekly episodes, where Michael Brandvold and Jay Gilbert, two longtime music industry pros, discuss the very latest trends, tools, and tactics that you need to succeed in this Build new- a stunning band website in minutes with Bandzoogle. Go to bandzoogle.com to start your free 30-day trial and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. You got Mike, you got Jay. This is going to be just a fun guest and a fun interview. Yeah. We're not talking, well, yeah. we are talking about music marketing, but not tactics and techniques and what to do and what not to do. Yeah. We're talking with, Somebody whose father was, I was just, his father was Neil Bogart from Casablanca Records. Yeah. And you don't get much more over the top marketing than, than what Casablanca was. Yeah. But before we get into that, just a quick shout out and a thank you to Bruce and everybody at Hypebot and Bands in Town for everything you do to support us and to our sponsors, Bandzoogle.com. Built by musicians for musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform that makes it so easy to build a stunning website and EPK for your music. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, including dozens of fully customizable templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters, integrations with Bandcamp, SoundCloud, YouTube, Bands in Town, and many more, so you can easily add content from your other online profiles. And of course, the amazing Bandzoogle.com live tech support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. They also just recently added custom landing pages for musicians. You can now easily create your own music landing page using preset page templates and built-in funnel tools will help get your pages up and running and added to your music marketing campaign in just minutes. Plans at bandzoogle.com start at just $8.29 a month, and that includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. Music Biz Weekly podcast listeners, head over to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY, all one word, when you sign up. And you'll get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's bandzoogle.com, promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY. And of course, thank you, thank you so much to discmakers.com. We all know it's a digital world today, but there's still such an important role for physical media for today's musicians. Digital royalty payments can be so small that selling products like CD and vinyl online and at gigs has become such an important income generator. For every CD you sell at a gig, you might need roughly 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money, and that's a lot of streams. Our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl and USB drives. Head over to discmakers.com, place an order for 100 or more CDs, and when you check out, use the promo code FREEBIZ, all one word, and you'll save up to $150 in shipping costs. Jay, who is this incredible chat with? We have a very special treat for our listeners and viewers this week. We have Timothy Bogart. Uh, he's a writer, producer of a new film called Spinning Gold, all about his father, Neil Bogart, who's an icon in this industry, Buddha Records, Casablanca Records, worked with Kiss, Donna Summer, you know, uh, uh, Village People, uh, George Clinton, the list goes on and on and on. A, a true visionary um, a, a true pioneer in the music industry. Um, and we're just so thrilled to talk uh, with Timothy Bogart. Yeah, I, I, all I say is just let it roll, listen to this interview. And then on March 31st, go out and check out Spinning Gold. If you are a fan of music history, this, this, movie's, this movie's filled with so much history. Mike, today we are thrilled and honored to be joined by Timothy Bogart, who is the writer and producer 
of a new film uh, that we recently watched a screener of called Spinning Gold. Timothy, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Oh, this is this me. this is this is a real this is a real honor. So let's let's just start out by mentioning your last name. Anybody who's been involved <laughs> in the music business for decades, going back to at least the seventies, should recognize, hopefully, recognize the name Bogart. And you are the son of the legendary record executive Neil Bogart. Okay. So spinning gold is is your story of neil is that is that how you would describe it you know i i think it's even broader than that i mean it's certainly um a love letter to my father there, there's no question but um we weren't just kids like you know and then there was this business that was going on there was no delineation ever between work and play and uh, family and business um, I spent every day after school sitting on those Casablanca offices, sitting in on marketing meetings. At, you know, my father would hold up, do you want th this record cover or this one? And us stupid kids would be like, oh, that one, Dad. And, 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 and he goes right to that, the target market, doesn't he? Right, wow. Truly right to the target market. Um, and so and so ultimately, it was it was broader, um, I think, than just a love letter to my dad. I, I really wanted to make a love letter to music. Uh, in general, and this particular group of extraordinary artists who were beyond just artists, they were all family, um, and the other folks that had got lost to history, um, sure. the people who worked with my father. So it was a love letter to a, a much broader base, I think, but certainly the anchor, of course, was um, trying to say, you know, hey, to my to my dad, who, who impacted yeah. so many. What a and wonderful the, the cast of characters from watching <laughs> the film. Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, I knew the story uh, of Neil but I didn't know all of these other characters and how they played with each other. And it was so fascinating for me, but let's step back a little bit because you just mentioned something that I would really love to hear about. And what was that like? What are your earliest memories of, you know, going to the office, you know, with your dad and seeing some of these artists come in and these meetings and these albums and talk about those earliest memories. It was the greatest playground ever. Uh, I mean, to, to begin with, when you when you stepped foot or, or forget step foot, when you drove into the parking lot at Casablanca Records, you heard the music. The music was blasting at 8255 Sunset, spilling out over Sunset Boulevard, over to Carlos and Charlie's or Roy's, the restaurants across the street, the famous restaurants across the street. <laughs> um, so there was this infectious energy from the moment you hit the parking lot. And as you kind of move through the through the halls, every office was playing something different. You know, they were playing, they were on the phone to, to DJs going, listen to this new one. Um, they were screaming at, at program directors trying to get, get songs placed or yelling at Billboard to try to get the songs up the chart. It was Wow. electrifying um and then yes my father would just the kids were, were part of the company too so we really did sit in on these meetings and you know sitting there going what do you guys think of this love gun I'm like, we think that's cool i want to be part of that uh what do you what about these disco <laughs> bells i i want that we take them and bring them to wow. our school my dad would give us this stuff we'd take them to school head about to friends we were the ultimate i think test audience um but but the artists themselves i'll tell, I'll tell you a really fun Please. Fun story that, that I think was evocative of, of what it was like. Uh, there was a there was a time um, uh, when I was bouncing back and forth between my mother's home in Boston after they had separated and my father's home in Los Angeles. Um, and and they certainly you know as as divorced couples will have well, there there was some friction at, at a certain point, uh, but but it was playfully played out. And, and in one way that was played out, my mother decided that I was going to play the violin, and so. <laughs> I remember coming out to Los Angeles, my little violin case, it's probably 10 years old. Um, and I went right for ballet X to the Castellanca offices. And I remember seeing my dad's eyes as I walked in with his little violin case. I said, what is that? I showed him my violin case. He said, okay, I made a phone call. 15 minutes later, Gene Simmons comes in and he says, what's that? Said, it's my violin. <laughs> he said, he grips it and he smashes it against the wall. And then, he hands me a bronze top 1978 Gibson Les Paul Deluxe and a pig nose amplifier that I still wow. play today. And he said, you're going to play oh, a rock wow. and roll kid. So I, this was not, you know, the guys in makeup on stage. This was my uncle Gene. I mean, it, it was and my aunt Donna. I mean, it was, it, it was a larger than life fairy tale 
for anybody, but for a child, my gosh, it was extraordinary. Well, you know, Tim, Tim, I think larger than life is a perfect description for, for Neil Casablanca and how he approached the music industry because he's a, he, he, he's a, he was a record industry executive, but he also had, he legitimately had ears. He could hear yeah. great music, oh, yeah. but he was also, you know, to say he understood marketing is to downplay his understanding of marketing. He was larger than life. If it, if we can't do it big, don't do it at all. A pioneer. Sort of attitude. It was a pioneer. Absolutely. He went against the current, it seems like, his whole career. He was upsetting everything all the time. Do you think something like that could exist, could happen today in the music I, industry? I really don't. I, I, you know, my brother, Evan, who's also in, in the music business, uh, we talk about it all the time, um, about what he would be doing today. And, and I certainly believe without question, he'd be ahead of all of us. But I don't think if it was starting out at this moment um, that, that you could have done what he did. Um, and look, some of it was, you know, certainly outside the edges. I mean, you, oh, there's of no course. question. This was the time of payola. It was a real thing. It wasn't an ugly thing if you were part of it, but it was a real thing. Um, those marketing uh, ploys and, and madness and the way he got the money for the for the mothership, uh, which I didn't <laughs> depict in the film. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, just from a pure maybe a legal versus illegal uh, situation it might not have necessarily gone over so well uh, today. But I think it's bigger than that. I think it's about the spirit of independence. And, you know, you certainly have um, some independent labels today, but even them, are, you know, are five seconds into it, you know, it, it's, it's about how they're going to become corporatized. And that was the antithesis of, of what my father ran to. I mean, you go back to you know, at 24 years old, he was the youngest uh, person to ever run uh, a publicly traded company when he was running MGM Records. Um, so he certainly started in the corporate, in the corporate veil, under the corporate veil, um, but at Cameo, which was independent, into Buddha Records, which was wildly independent. Mm -hmm. um, and then even though he had this distribution partnership with Warner Brothers when, when he moved out to, to launch Casablanca, it was from the moment it started, it was doomed to fail because it was the difference between corporate and independent. So today to launch something so um, unbelievably and truly individualized by, by one person's vision, um, I think that's yeah. really hard to come by and I, and I don't see it. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I'm wondering how you distilled all of that madness, all that wonderful creativity into the stories that you told in this film, because I know just from reading about your father and about Casablanca, there are countless stories that could have been included. How did you distill that down to the ones that you picked? And did you reach out to some of these players to jog your memory and get anecdotes? How did that work? I reached out to all of them um, and all of them loved him so warmly. They opened up th that reality to me um, in with incredible generosity. Um, and I mean, you know, from Clive Davis to Barry Gordy to wow. Donna before she passed, Jean and Paul were intimately involved. Um, you know, they, they, they talked to my production designers and my costume designers. And they wanted to make sure we got it right, not necessarily how other people perceived it, but how, how they remembered it. So on the one hand, I had this extraordinary um, entree into um, people's memories. Now, memories are a funny thing. Pe people mm -hmm. tend to make themselves the stars of their, of their own memories. That, that was a thing I found. <laughs> so, so I would try to triangulate. You know, I, I, I always kind of look at it as, you know, if you're at Studio 54 any night and you were looking across that dance floor, but you were on the left side, you saw a different night than if you were looking at it from the right side. Now, the night had still happened, but right. your experience of it might very well have, have been different. And I think that that was very true. Um, you know, so, so I would try to meet with as many people and talk to as many people to try to get as much of, of the essence of what happened. And then I'd be blessed. You know, George Clinton has the most encyclopedic mind. I mean, I, I could ask him something. He'd tell me what the set list was that night, who, who maybe came backstage that night. I mean, for a guy who was pretty, pretty out there during that yeah. time. 
it, yeah. his memory was spotless and flawless. Um, so I was really able to glean a lot of that in terms of what to include versus what to exclude. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, something like this is much more of a sculpture than a painting. Um, it really was about what to take out, um, not to what put in. And, and the more I struggled with what to include, I, I, at one point early on in the process, happened upon this premise that, like any great record, uh, at the time when there were records, <laughs> when the sequence of an album was almost as important as what songs oh, were sure. on the yep. album, you yeah. put that, that needle down and you had an experience that lasted beyond, beyond the one track. Um, and how the third track played in to the fourth track was, was crucial to the, to the experience of that, that album. That's right. And, and, and I envisioned the, the story as my father putting together this wonderful album of the greatest hits of his life. And, and once I sort of did that, certainly there were other great hits that could have been included, but I was able to sort of narrow it down to those that I thought were most consequential to drive the narrative, but at the same time being evocative of what the purpose of, of, of that story was or, or what the essence of, of what those scenes were. Um, so it wasn't easy. You know, I mean, the first draft, I think, was about 200 pages, um, and I kept having <laughs> to winnow it down. And even while we were shooting, you know, when, when I was towards the end of the shooting, I still had this wonderful sequence about... And the great Ty Dolla Sign was going to play Curtis. And it was a, this ah. crazy story when Curtis was dragged out of his mind on this show called Flipside, which my stepmom Joyce had, had created. It was kind of like the first, you know, um, mm -hmm. music show that was actually, you know, filmed and, and recorded at the record plant. So you actually heard music the way it was supposed to be on television. But Curtis showed up and he was just whacked out of his mind. And my dad said, I guess the only way is for me to try to catch up. And so he got terribly stoned, took a bunch of quaaludes so that he could get out of the same uh, playing field as Curtis and ultimately went and interviewed Curtis and did this beautiful piece on Superfly. And yeah, there were drugs involved, but it was so much more wow. about the experience of connecting with that artist in a space and in a place. And that was a beautiful piece. And it told, told a really fun story, great movie story, but a great emotional story about his connectivity with Curtis, which ultimately I just couldn't fit in the box of, of a two-hour film. So that, that was tough. If we get to the end and, and, and in the film, I go, oh, yeah. And by the way, village people, you could do 10 hours on the oh, incredible yeah. story of yeah. what the village people. Very few people know that that story. And it's a fascinating story. Um, so ultimately, though, I kind of got to the end. I was like, ah, but I think we're done with the story I was telling. And that would have kind of taken us on another place. So um, the answer is. I just kept carving and whittling and whittling and whittling. Um, and, and ultimately, um, these, I think, are the greatest hits that, that sum up what I think he would have sequenced if he only had that many tracks on those two sides. I, I think describing it as the greatest hits is perfect because yeah. as, as, as our listeners know, and, and we told you before we hit record, Jay and I are, are longtime huge Kiss fans. So, you know, I went into this excited to, to maybe get some Kiss out of this. But I quickly realized, and it wasn't a bad realization. This is not a movie about Kiss. This is not a movie about Donna Summer. This wasn't a movie about George Clinton. This was a movie about Neil Bogart and his life and the labels he worked. And these artists were all, and I'm not saying this to downplay them, but they were all bit parts in that story mm -hmm. through history. Um, so when you were putting this all together and and listen we know this is not a a true documentary in the sense of a documentary being filmed where did you feel like you could get a little more creative in storytelling to make it more interesting when that might have not been quite the reality and it's funny to ask you this because that's what neil was all about was well, percep I perception is reality it's big because so you, we say you, it's big. You, it's, and both of you just answered your own question. That was the compass. So look, as any biopic um, is confronted by history versus you know, a narrative drive that makes it enjoyable for, for an audience, those are, tough, those are tough things that are immediately in conflict with one another. Um, as a music biopic, Nobody takes this stuff more seriously than fans. So at the very beginning, the contract that I made with myself, I, I well, first of all, I knew I did not want to do a, a movie about 
um, what Midnight Train to Georgia sounded like on vinyl or what It's Your Thing sounded like uh, on the radio, um, because we all know what that sounded like. And we all know, you know, the impact of what those songs were. I really thought the interesting story was how they came to be. And, and of course, everyone, you know, can, can, will say all songs are a story, but there's an incredible story to get to the song. And that's really what I wanted to explore. I, I was committed to writing the first draft of music history. I wanted to see what it was like the first time George Clinton thought, we want the funk. What does that mean? <laughs> Why was he saying that? I wanted to see the first time Bill Withers ever sang Lean On Me. Once I did that, and made that decision that I was never going to talk about a release, a master. It was always going to be the journey to the master. It did a number of things. One is it created an incredible freedom to move around the timeline a little because I was no longer latched into what well, that was released on this date on this year. It takes a little time to write that song, to develop that song, to decide does it belong on this album or the next album. And so that it gave me some freedom, um, again, all anchored in, in what I think was the real timeline about just about when these songs would have been initially ideated, but it gave me great freedom. It also I, I gave this wonderful cast an opportunity to make it their own because to, yeah. to have you know Wiz Khalifa or Taylor Parks or Lettucey come and say, now Lettucey, be Gladys Knight. Well, well, no, why, why, would, why would we do that? Let her, let her be a version of how Gladys Knight found the version that we ultimately get to, but now that gives us great freedom to experience it in a different way. So. That was really important from a music side. And that gave me, I think, great freedom to stay completely locked to the fidelity of the actual music timeline of when things were released in history, but allowed me some freedom to move around the timeline because I am bouncing around from the 60s to the 70s. And even in the 70s, we start in February 74 with the, with the launch of the Casablanca party. And then we get to 77. So there's like this three year, four year period where I don't go. And then it's six months later. It don't, we just the right. movie drove to it. And by having that freedom, I think that gave me great flexibility, but, but always staying um, committed to the fidelity of the music timeline. Um, so that, that was really, really important. But, but what you guys pointed out to, I think was far more important. I thought from the beginning, the best way to tell this movie uh, the story was if Neil Bogart told the story. I thought he was the director, not me. He was a cinematographer, not my cinematographer. And once yeah. I made that decision that here's a guy saying, look, now, to, to back up just a hair, I always sure. thought the movie was a final confession, right? A guy reaches the, you know, the end, uh, end of his life and, and basically you know, gets to the pearly gates and they say, no, 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 you're not coming up here. You're the sex, drugs, and rock and roll guy. You did all sorts of bad stuff. Leave. And, and, and Neil says, no, no, wait, wait, wait. I, I, okay, I know I did some bad things, but let me explain it. And then he bounces back to those moments. Yeah, I did that, but I also did that. Once you've got a guy fighting for his life, defending the, the substance and the sum of his life, then his perception is when it was scary, it was the scariest thing there ever was. When it was sexy, it was the sexiest thing there ever was. When it was dark, it was the darkest. When it was loud, it was the loudest. So everything was amped up as my father did in his own life to give us the audience members the most heightened version of those stories because that's yeah. how he actually remembered it. Um, you know, one of the probably the, the most tricky choices I made, and it goes to your guys' passion for Kiss, is shouted out loud in 1974. Now, he never, of course they did not, there was one of the only things in the whole movie where I said, but you have to have shouted out loud in this movie. And this is the only place to do it. And so I sort of, you know, debated with myself saying, well, how do I justify it at least to myself? Because I think it's important. And, and the two ways I justified it was, um, on the one hand, maybe they did, and I don't think they actually did, but maybe they did have that song that didn't make it on the first album. They were still workshopping it. They didn't play it at Century Plaza that, that night. However, if my father was trying to remember why this band was so spectacular, even if Warner Brothers or the executives didn't, didn't remember it, he'd remember them playing that song. And so the moment he's the guy transporting us there, I think it gave us some freedom. But that's one of the true yeah. and, and only real leaps that I made. Everything else... Um, was really just a matter of, look, something's in a timeline, a couple scenes in real life may have occurred and I needed to do it in one. So I had to sort of combine events and maybe put sure. them in a room they weren't at because it would have other taken six months to play that story out. Yeah. But ultimately every story you see happened. 
<laughs> the yeah. essence of every event occurred. Yeah. So that was very important to me. I, I didn't want to mess around with history. Um, I wanted to celebrate it, but I certainly wanted to embrace his perception, how he wanted us. Got to it. Move. Yeah. You know, one of the beautiful things for me is more subtle. It wasn't about that. It was about you could smell and taste the film. And what I mean by that is you saw rotary phones, you saw reel to reel uh, tape players, you know, you, you saw people smoking, you know, it really pulled in that shag carpet kind of hairspray. I mean, you could really taste that film. I thought the job that you did on recreating that really pulled me into that era. Talk a little bit about all the accoutrement. Yeah, that was, you know, a great challenge because for the most part, anything I've ever seen done in the 70s always looks at it as a joke. Uh, I, I, I mean, I really can't point to something that, that was really a celebration of music in the 70s that did not become a cartoon and a caricature of that period of time where the hair was even bigger and the collars were even bigger. You know, people talk about, gosh, it was the worst, um, you know, style at the time. Really? Why does it keep coming back, A? And B, this is when Norma Kamali came of age. Some of our greatest designers came of age designing at Studio 54. If you really look at those photos, those people look great. It was the <laughs> sexiest time. It was the greatest party. It was not a place that you kind of felt icky about what was on the carpets. And so that was really important that we didn't overperiod the period. And that extended to costumes, yeah. carpets, walls, uh, equipment. Boy, you know, getting equipment right in a, in a music movie is, is, is heavy lifting. Um, I bet. One, because you got to talk to enough people who can really remember what would have been in that room. Uh, and then you got to source it. And then you got to hope it works. The number of pieces right. of equipment that we brought in, we would get there, especially like Giorgio Moroda's bad lab, which was so important to try to build that. But none of it would work on the day. So we'd be shooting it. The lights would go on, the tracks wouldn't move. And you're shooting going, but it's a, I have to show these things working. So you have some practical logistical challenges, but, but the, the, to me, you walk into a, to a movie like this and it all seems like it's not possible. Um, the, the antics that my father was involved in feel not just large in life, maybe too large for life. Um, and yet they really were real. And so I thought it was so important to anchor as much of the movie in something we did believe that we did feel was true so that you didn't immediately assume these other things were not because they really were. It just was a magical time. And boy, the seventies was, uh, again, I, I just don't think enough people pay it enough respect, honestly. I, I just think it becomes yeah. a bit of a joke decade. And I thought it was a, uh, an extraordinarily consequential one. Do you, do you think the artists that Neil discovered and broke on Casablanca would have worked at a different label in that same period of time? Or was it because these artists were as larger than life as Neil himself was, and they both sort of understood where each of them were coming from, you know, because yeah. as Kiss fans, you know, the, the, I, I was, I was so happy to see you didn't gloss over the Warner brothers relationship because we know as fans, you know, Warner brothers was right off the bat saying, get rid of that makeup, drop the makeup off a of kiss or we're, yep. we're done with this band. Yep. And, you know, so is, 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 was Casablanca and Neil the only place these so over the top, larger than life artists would have ever worked? You know, I think the answer is different for the Buddha artists um, than for the Casablanca artists. Um, and so there's no question at Buddha, he, he broke lots of ground, you know, uh, giving artists their own labels. You know, when, when Ron Isley you know, had his own label and when Curtis had his own label and, and empowering um, still revolutionary music at the time, Fight the Power. Which, I mean, these were, these were some pretty racy songs that, that really challenged the culture and society at the time. But I still think the artists may have been happier than they were at Motown. But certainly Motown was doing miraculous stuff with extraordinary artists. So I think that that particular group of art, look, you know, Gladys was doing um, when Peaceful Waters Flow at Motown. Could Barry have just as easily uh, embraced Midnight Train? It's 
It's a pretty extraordinary song, I imagine so. So I think that there's probably a difference between those artists. Um, although he was a revolutionary in his thinking, you know, he saw the, the gospel pop crossover. Others didn't at the time uh, with Oh Happy Day. Um, you know, yummy, 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 I got love in my tummy. People thought he was a joke with that bubblegum music stuff, mm -hmm. but everyone else was making 60s music and, and important political music. And he said, I, I think someone just wants to chew gum and, and hang out and have fun. But I think still there's other labels that could have. I don't know whether they would have, but they could have. But I think Casablanca's artists, Parliament, Village People, Donna, Kiss, were each so uniquely unique. Um, they were so uniquely against anything else in the space at that time. Sure, you had Alice Cooper, but Kiss was frankly bigger and bolder. They, they just were. Um, I don't think so. And I think that the Warner Brothers story is the perfect um, evidence of that. It's not just that they thought, use different makeup. They hated Kiss. They hated mm -hmm. everything about them. Sure, we'll support it because we've just given you three million bucks and you spent four, but take off the makeup. But they hated that band that would never have supported them. They didn't understand because at the time, of course, and I think this is probably a, a crucially important element here, if there was no radio, there was no act. Um, and Kiss was not a radio act. And Donna's three minute Love to Love You was not a radio act. It didn't fit soul, it didn't fit R&B, disco hadn't come across the ocean yet. So these were acts that Parliament was not a radio act. You'd have to sit there for 25 minutes and listen to a, to a George song. So I think it took a visionary like him to see the vision in those acts and be um, just as committed to their visions of themselves um, as they were. And I don't think that would have happened at another label. I don't know what other label was working at that time um, that, that had anything like the Casablanca acts. And it's why you sort of reached a moment at Casablanca's height where the, the music buying public went to Tower Records and said, what's new from Casablanca? They didn't say what's new from Donna or what's new from Georgia. They said, what is new from Casablanca? That's a crazy thing for, for a record Rare. company to become the act itself. Yeah, there's a handful of those, the Motowns of the world. There are very, sure. very few of those on, on the planet. You know, he was certainly a visionary. Um, and you can see that in retrospect, but I would imagine back in those days, there were people questioning like, what the hell are you doing? These are not two minute 50 pop songs that you're, you're putting together. And the thing that I, I would really love to hear about is as I watch the film, there's a lot of joy in, yeah. in a lot of these circumstances, even under adversity, just the attitude and the, you know, the snarkiness. And it's like, I can't do it. Watch me, you know, that sort of thing. Tell me about what was that like back in those days, you know, kind of behind the scenes, was it as joyful at, even through some of the adversity as it appears? It, re it really was. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, I paraphrase it in the movie. I have, I have Jeremy Jordan who plays my dad say it to some degree in the movie, but it was the most amazing thing when I did these interviews. And again, whether it was a Clive Davis or a, or a Gene or a, a Gladys or whoever I spoke to, 201, especially the director executives, they would hit do not disturb on their phone. They tell their assistants, whatever, hey, I'm with Neil Bogart's kid, leave me alone. And they look at me and, and you suddenly saw this just whimsical look come across their face. And they'd say some version of this, I swear, and Clive Davis said it exactly. Don't, I, I said, just tell me what it felt like. That's what I want to know. Don't tell me a specific, just tell me what it felt like. And he said, don't know how I survived it. Don't know if I do it again. <laughs> Greatest fucking time of my life. And, and when they said that, there was a just totally extraordinarily potent joy in the statement and in the memory. And every one of them, I think, felt that was a time we will never get back and yet it was crazy, there's some, some wild stuff, but wow, that was an amazing period of time. And, and, and I think the through line was joy, which is something I also don't think we feel as much in today's music business. The joy of making music, of listening to music, of experiencing music, 
Um, I think it was a very, very unique time. And, and I do think it really was joyful. I do think, especially at Casablanca, but not just Casablanca, this idea that, you know, the clock, you know, at seven or eight o'clock at night didn't end your, end your day or Friday didn't end your, your week. Um, you, you did, this was who they were, not what they did. And I think there's an important distinction. Was, was your dad, and maybe this is sort of a follow-up to what Jay just asked, was your dad dealing with, I don't know, like an internal conflict of, oh my God, I need to be bigger, larger than life, do more, do more, put on a bigger show. But at the same time, and this is, this is illustrated throughout the movie, we're losing money. We're losing money. I mean, it was, was there an internal conflict that he may have been going, how much more can I push this? Because we're losing millions and millions and millions of dollars, yet I don't want people to know, a la the go out and repaint the outside of the Casablanca record offices. You know, I want people to think things are going great. I mean, I got to imagine there had to be some sort of a, you know, a realistic struggle of like, okay, at the end of the day, yeah, we got to make money to be able to do this, but I don't want people to know we aren't larger than life i think i think all of those things are, are true um I, I the larger than life bigger that was something i think goes back to the eight-year-old kid in brooklyn I, I think that had nothing to do with music necessarily i think it had a lot to do with his relationship with his father um who he loved his father uh, who was played by jason isaacs in the movie um, but his father was a dreamer who was never going to reach those dreams, was a gambler who never won, was an addict who, you know, couldn't find any success at the end of, of, of that addictive uh, personality. Um, and I think um, very much my father did not want to be his father. And I think that drove him um, in a very uh, powerful way. I think um, he's a guy who didn't finished high school so he wasn't very well educated um i think he uh, with my mom you know she was the 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 rich daughter of you know very wealthy new york family and he was from the other side of the tracks um i, I think it, it, it i don't know if it's a chip on his shoulder but but i think he had this drive um to not be him hence hence going from Neil Bocats to Neil Scott to Wayne Stewart to Wayne Roberts. I mean, this guy kept reinventing himself until he ultimately created the character of Neil Bogart. Um, that probably was the truest version of himself, but he had to find his way there. So I think that had a lot to do with the drive. Um, the best, the, the, not the best, but the most fascinating thing that I learned um, making the movie, I think, you know, all kids know who their parents became. Very few of us know who they were when, before they became them and, and what that was like on their journey to it. And, and I, by necessity, found myself doing a forensic investigation into who this guy was. Um, I saw the larger than life guy who was ordering more, you know, food and, and, and not just for this table. Hey, that table, do you guys want some something too? And, and uh, the whole restaurant, you know, uh, I remember I had a Little League game, <laughs> he coached Little League, and one kid showed up to my Little League game, didn't have, didn't have a glove. He's like, everybody in the cars and took us all to Big Fives. Everybody gets a glove. And does your brother want a glove? And how about your brother's friend? Does he want a glove? And your parents, says, that was not fake. That's just who he was. He was, he was the the orchestrator of every party um and and, and he just kept inviting he, want, he wanted to, to make party. everybody happy he wanted he everybody to be happy he, he did now what i what i didn't know growing up was how scared he was and and how aware he was of how dangerous it was you know we, mm. we touch on this in the movie as well you know, Warner Brothers gives him $3 million as a distribution advance, and he spends four of the three before they start. So that's true. Now they are literally, you know, let's do another album just to get the distributor advance, and then we'll go figure out what the album is. So they're constantly chasing that ability. And he finally takes what he did early on. And I had some wonderful scenes with the great Morris Levy um, that, I, that I ended up not being able to make, uh, mm. put, put in the film, because Morris and my father became oddly very very strange friends going back to cameo into buddha records i mean they met literally at, at gunpoint to one another which was always the story i was going to open the movie with and it ultimately just didn't didn't fit at the end where, where, where they pulled guns on each other which was a crazy wow. story with morris but ultimately going to las vegas to gamble is one thing going to las vegas and taking a line of credit to gamble with 
is another thing, but it's okay because you're gambling it and they think you're right. going to lose it. He took the line of credit and Went left home. town with the yep. money to make payroll. That's crazy. So that's something I didn't know or didn't see. I did know that at one point my uncle was walking out of Casablanca office and got attacked by three people with baseball bats and was in traction for eight months. So I knew that. I didn't know what we, that we were just told that he tripped up coming off the coming off the, the curb. So I didn't know how dire it was. And you know, Joyce, my stepmom, had a great. Great, great line to me she once explained about him that, that, that I think he once said to her uh, in a moment of, of real kind of confession, which was, you know, when you're a king, who do you confess to? Um, because the moment you do that, everybody who, who's there to support you suddenly questions that support and, and questions whether they can keep doing it. And the only person I think he was ever honest with um, was Joyce, uh, who was his true partner in, in all sense of the word. Um, so that was interesting to, to learn how scared he was and how, sure. how how close to the edge they were. But but I don't know that that was the the drive for why he was making it bigger. I just think that's who he was. I just think this other thing sure. also yeah. was happening. Yeah. Well, and 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 I, and I think that I think that's the 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 great part of this movie is you learn that about Neil the person. It, you know, it probably took me. 15 minutes into the movie before I was like, okay, this is actually an incredible insight into who he was mm -hmm. as a man. And yeah, we get all these other great stories from the labels and the artists and everything else. And, and, you know, I highly recommend everybody has to stay right through the very mm -hmm. end of the movie, go through the credits at the end because you know, hats off to you. That that end was so touching. It was it had a very I could feel it was coming personally from your heart as thank you, Dad. Yeah. Thank you. You know, so yeah. but but it it was just such an incredible peeling back as to who who Neil was. I mean there's there was the persona that was covered in media, but mm -hmm. now we've got who he was as a person what was he like as a family man how did he yeah. treat his employees and everything it was it, at the end i sat back and i go wow that was really a great movie mm -hmm. about neil yeah yeah and the thing that i thought when i was watching the film was i was kind of thinking about you watching the film and what i mean by that is i get sucked into movies and I forget I'm watching a movie like you. I become immersed in it. And there's certain scenes that are just magic. And I'm wondering, do you have a couple of those where maybe you were watching the filming or you're doing a take and you just sense that magic when something just, you know what I'm saying? I do. I, were there some moments like that for you where you were at? Oh, my God, we just nailed that. There were, you know, and the, the one that immediately comes to mind because I, being the son who's also directing this movie and writing this movie, um, it, the fact that I was a character in it in, in a scene, like it all felt weird. Like I kept trying <laughs> to distance myself, but right. but to not explain at least a little bit who he was as a, as a father, I thought was doing a terrible disservice as well. So, you know, the scene um, at the Century Plaza where he dances with my sister, Jill, yes. um, you know, that, 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 that's a true story. Um, it, but more than it being a true story, to me, it represented all of our feelings that the rain could be falling down, the walls could be crumbling down, but he would lift us up on his feet and dance us away and all was magical. And that was an incredibly important moment for me to capture. And I remember it was one of the first illustrations I had done about what I thought that image looked like. Um, we designed the set to match that illustration exactly. It is almost the, the identical image. But more than that, when we were filming, it, it was actually um, playing my, my sister, Jill, was actually my brother, Brad, producer's uh, um, daughter, Sloan, um, who, who played um, uh, her aunt. Um, mm -hmm. But... I remember watching that through the monitors and it just took my breath away because that's what it felt. His power to transport everybody into a place that was not just safe, but that was pure magic. Um, that was, that was moving as hell. That, that I, you know what, when I saw that right off the bat, I was like, wow, 
his world is potentially crumbling down upon him right here before he even got started. Yep. And yet he stopped and took time out to dance with his daughter. It was beautiful. Yeah. That was just like, that was a dad thing. That yep. is purely a dad thing. And yeah. that was a great moment. And, look, um, I, and, I, and I wish that, you know, I, as a father who have a 19 year old daughter, um, we, it wouldn't matter what meeting he was in or who, if we called, if we came, everything stopped. I wish I could be that, that, that committed and I've strived to be, but he was unique that way. Uh, us kids were everything uh, and we felt wow. that from him. Says a lot about the kind of man he was. But, but before, we, before we wrap up, Tim, um, what would Neil think of his legacy now? Meaning the artists. You know, would he be, would he sit back and go, God, I'm so proud of what village people kiss Donna Summer, you know, looking back. I mean, would he have that kind of fatherly pride in what he helped not just create that lasted a couple of years, but has lasted decades now? I, I think no quite. I mean, it's 50 years. Right. Um, and wow. Kiss just announced their final, 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 final tour. Final, I love, I love that little dig in the movie where you're going, yes, and they just announced the final, 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 final tour. <laughs> the, the, the fact that they're still going, he would, love, he would laugh his ass off with all the people who said they were a flash in the pan. Oh they yeah, weren't real. They weren't a real act. They were a gimmick. No mm -hmm. gimmick lasts fifty years. The fact that that Donna's music listen to Beyonce's album. I mean, that's a direct result of, 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 of I Feel Love and Giorgio. Um, you know, I've heard often, you know, Dr. Dre say there's no, there's no him without George Clinton in parliament. Um, these acts continue today. You, you can go into almost any club, you can go to any wedding and it's YMCA. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you go to any bar mitzvah, you hear lean on me, you can walk into a coffee shop and, and midnight train is playing. <laughs> um, that's a hell of a legacy. Yeah. Um, I, I think he would be so proud. And most importantly, I think he'd think he got the last laugh. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, from what I've learned about him through this movie, he would be the first one to sit back and go, yeah. You guys all doubted me. Mm -mm. That's right. I won. You know, I, I, my other podcast, the Kiss Podcast, we have a fun saying that we like to 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 repeat: "Forget the haters, we won." Because and and Absolutely. and we reference we reference that in the sense of here's Kiss fifty years later, still playing to sold out stadiums. How many haters going all the way back to 1974? To your point, they suck. They're not real musicians. They won't last. Here we are, we as the fans, we as the people who have always loved it, we won because these acts, and you can apply that to okay. all of these other artists that Neil brought forward. Yeah, and by the way, and, and just, just about, the, about the kissing, and it's not just, you know, 60, 70, 50, 67 year olds, it's their kids and it's their grandkids. Yeah who are member, proud members of the KISS Army. That's I've got a nine, I got a nine-year-old daughter who, when she was three years old, I took her to see KISS, and she was like, Daddy, I, wanna, I want a hug from the star man. You know? It, that, that, that's, a, that's an act for the ages. Absolutely. That, 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 that is. As, as a father who grew up as KISS, and I worked with KISS, it was a moment of like, my God, I can't believe I'm sharing this moment. Yeah with my daughter, because I am sure that Neil and every one of those artists never thought there would be 10 years of this, 20 years, let alone 50 years of this. I mean, I, it, nobody I, back I, in the seventies was thinking that long-term, were they? Uh, yes. And, and Gene Simmons was thinking that way. And, and Neil yeah. Bogart was thinking that way. And Gene once told me the story about early on where, where my father sat him down and said, do you want to be a band or do you want to be a brand? Because the band, you know, they'll definitely remember you for next year. You're a brand. You'll be remembered for all time. And Gene didn't hesitate. <laughs> He's like, sign me up. Yeah. Um, so I do think they saw the potency of what they were creating. Certainly Gene and Paul, um, I think, 
understood that uh, with my dad. Um, I don't know that Donna maybe necessarily saw the same vision, but but um, I think Parliament certainly certainly did. They understood that they were doing something that was timeless, um, and um, I do think that they, they saw. And, and that goes back to your earlier question of would another label have been able to be the right fit to fulfill that promise? Um, and, and I don't think so because of that. I think it requires someone who saw 50 years in the future. And so I think, yeah, he'd be, he'd be laughing. Very like few that. people could do that though. Yeah. yeah. He was a visionary yeah. for sure. Um, Timothy. So the spinning gold hits the theaters, March 31st nationwide, yes. worldwide, uh, nationwide in a number of international territories at, at the same time. And then it rolls out of, across the summer uh, around the world. Fantastic. Awesome. Uh, so you know, it, it, it's definitely a thumbs up movie. If, if you are a fan of music history, if you're a fan of the music business, um, this is an incredible story that you should go watch. Even if you weren't around in the 70s, yeah. go watch this because this is what laid the foundation for everything that's come since, in my opinion. Thank yeah. you so much, Tim. Here, Thanks, Timothy. Thanks so it's such an honor me. to talk to you, man. Uh, much success so much. for the film. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Visit discmakers.com to place an order for 100 or more CDs. And when you check out, use promo code FREEBIZ and get free shipping up to a one. Jay, that, that interview with Timothy was one of my all-time favorite Mine interviews too. because I felt like, I almost felt like I forgot I was interviewing him for the podcast and we were yeah. just we were just talking about history some incredible yeah. oh uh, you know at least at least for you and i maybe not sure. as much for other listeners but for you and i neil bogart played Iconic. an incredible role in our our life as Absolutely. kids you know as as spinning gold it says in there neil bogart created the soundtrack for our lives mm -hmm. Yeah, he sure did. And it was such a pleasure to talk to Timothy because he was in the room, you know, he was there. And to your point, it really felt like we were having a conversation over coffee and everything else sort of disappeared. And our listeners and viewers get to benefit from that. I thought it was probably the most enjoyable interview we've ever done. It was really special. Yeah, yeah. You know, Two thumbs up to the movie Spinning Gold. You've got yeah. to go check it out. If you are in the music industry, go watch it. Even if you don't know who Neil was or Casablanca, yeah. um, there's some incredible history here that you're going to learn about. And, you know, it was it's exciting to learn about somebody like Neil who had a great ear, but also was over the top in yeah. his marketing and promotion. Yeah. And he was one of the first, he was a pioneer, a visionary. And we don't throw those words around very often, but he was definitely those two things. Yeah. So check out Spinning Gold when it opens in theaters nationwide on March 31st. Um, let us know what you think of the movie. You know, we saw an early screener of it. Uh, I love it. It was, it was just, it was so much fun. So much fun. So yeah. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Casablanca, and everything that, that he touched. Um, before we wrap up, quick shout out to Bruce and everybody at HypeBot and Bands in Town. Thank you for your support. And, of course, to our sponsors, Bandzoogle.com and DiscMakers.com. Thank you for all you do every week to support the Music Biz Weekly podcast. That's it, everybody. We'll see you next episode. Com. Subscribe on YouTube. Follow and rate us on Spotify. Subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. We appreciate and your Industry support. professionals listen to the Music Biz Weekly podcast. If you have a product or service and would like to reach this audience, get in touch with Michael or Jay to discuss sponsorship this opportunities. For Music Biz Weekly, provided by LarryDavisVoice.com and by Jessica Mars Voice.